let's give Jesus the glory he deserves. Come on, let's give him the glory he deserves. The glory is all his. I wanna, I want you all to just raise your hands in this moment. Why do we do this? This is just a sign of surrenderance. If you got pulled over by the cops, they'd say, raise your hands. Just means you're not holding on to anything else. So in this moment, I just wanna encourage you not to hold on to anything else and reach on to Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, that tonight is a night of freedom of victory, of power, of reconciliation, of your love here tonight. We hold nothing in our hands any longer. When we put things in our hands, we destroy it, but when we put it in your hands, you bring it to life. So tonight, God, we give it to you, and we cannot wait for you to bring it to life. Lord, we love you, and we thank you in Jesus' mighty name. And we all said, amen, amen, amen. amen. Go ahead and take a seat. Thank you so much. My name is Bryant. I'm the youth pastor here at the Wayward Outreach. I'm excited. Where are our teens at? Where's our youth at? I think our teenagers are on this side. I don't know if we missed them. I don't know if we missed them. Let's go! <laughs> we have the most incredible youth ministry in the world, I believe, because we have the most incredible team in the world and the most incredible teens in the world. But uh, before we continue, I just want to honor our pastors. Let's give it up for Pastor Marco and Pastor Lisa tonight. Where I would not be here if it wasn't for them. Let's give it up for our campus pastors, Pastor Christian and Yesenia, right down here. Where I also would not be here if it wasn't for them. Tonight is such an incredible night because this is such a humbling moment for me. I've been at this church for 10 years, and this is my first opportunity to be able to preach to the whole congregation. And as Christian was saying, close your eyes, man, I almost started crying at that very moment. I was saying, God, I'm so grateful that I get to be here. 10 years ago? Oh, my goodness. Where was I 10 years ago? Where were you 10 years ago? 10 years ago, I was... An unbeliever, angry, depressed, I hated the world, but I came into a church called The Way World Outreach, and I said yes, and I went through the process, and I got delivered, and I got set free, and I heard scripture, and I repented, and I followed him, and I just want to show you a brief photo of my family right behind me, and what God has blessed me with. There's my beautiful wife. We've been married for six years now. I got three children now. My son, Josiah, my daughter, Genesis, and my brand new son. He was born 10 days ago. Only double digits just 10 days ago. Guess what his name is? Judah Maverick. Come on, somebody. That's, he better live up to that name, right? But, um, but again, I'm so grateful that you here would allow me to just speak into your lives tonight. I want to go into what we've been covering, but before I do, I just want to show you what's coming up in about a month. There is a concert specifically for youth and young adults. We, co we can go ahead and put that right there. Now, this is an open concert to the general population, so you are welcome to come if you are not a youth or young adult. So if you do come, I just ask this one thing, you have a youth or young adult right next to you. So go ahead and take your phone out, scan that QR code, register yourself in a youth and a young adult, send it to teenagers, invite that crazy cousin who uh, is saying they're never going to believe in Jesus, that was me, bring them into the house of God, it's going to be an incredible night, I will preach the gospel, and I believe that they will get saved, and who believes that too? All right, let's go and fill this house with the next generation. So who's in love with our fast that we have going on right now? The, what's the hardest thing for you? My, the hardest thing for me is the water. The water. As soon as this fast came out, my wife laughed and looked straight at me. Because I'm an I'm a energy drink a day kind of guy. Anybody there? 
type of person. Like, I just need an energy drink. I don't even know why I want an energy drink. I just, I need to drink it. That's the type of person I am. But um, this fast has caused me not to be so reliant on an energy drink and be reliant on the Lord. But I want to do a slight recap of what we've been going in the book of James, chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. So go ahead and jump in there with me. You can also see it behind me. And before I go there, I want you to turn to your neighbor and say the title of this message. You ready? Better watch your mouth. <laughs> Tell it to them again. You better watch your mouth. That's the title of tonight's message. James chapter 3, verse 1 through 4. Dear brothers and sisters, that's you and I. Not many of you should become teachers in the church. For we who teach will be judged more strictly. Indeed, we all make many mistakes. For if we could control our tongues, we would be perfect and could also control ourselves in every other way. We can make a large horse go wherever we want by means of a small bit in its mouth. And a small rudder makes a huge ship turn wherever the pilot chooses to go. Even though the winds are strong. Tonight... You're going to learn that your words have a major impact on your life and others. And truly, your words are a representation of what's already in your heart. But great news, tonight we're going to be set free from the destructive language of our words. So say this, say this with me. Words create words, worlds. Words create worlds. Genesis chapter 1 verse 3 Starts in the beginning, God saying, let there be light, and there was light. God did not need to use his hands to build things. By his great power and nature, he was able to speak something into existence. For your mom and dad and our parents, they did not necessarily need to go into a bedroom and say, let there be child, and there you came to be. They obviously needed to put some action behind some words. But before that action came probably some flirtation, right? And before the flirtation came some words. The words might have been like, yo. <laughs> right? Hey. Sup? <laughs> Partial words, to be exact, right? Or as I used to grow up, I used to do this thing like, Right? <laughs> My wife did not fall for any of that. Praise God. She's a woman of God, okay? But what I need you to understand is that our words have the power, and really, words were a precursor of action. You and I are a result of words that resulted in action that resulted in us. Here's something I want you to understand and save it for later as another note. Your words are also a representation of your heart. Now let's jump into tonight's scripture that I get the opportunity to dive in as we're reading in the book of the month, in the book of the year. James chapter 3 verse 5 through 12 says this, in the same way the tongue is a small thing that makes grand speeches, just like I'm doing right now. But a tiny spark can set a great forest on fire. And among all the parts of the body, the tongue is a flame of fire. It is a whole world of wickedness corrupting your entire body. It can set your whole life on fire, for it is set on fire by hell itself. People can tame all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and fish, but no one can tame the tongue. It is a restless and evil thing. Full of deadly poison. Sometimes it praises our Lord and Father like we were doing tonight. And sometimes we go home and do something else. And sometimes it curses those who have been made in the image of God. And so blessing and cursing come pouring out of the same mouth. Surely, my brothers and sisters, this is not right. Does a spring of water bubble with both fresh water and bitter water? Does a fig tree produce olives? or a grapevine produce figs? No, and you can't draw fresh water from a salty spring. Words create worlds. There was a, uh, a word that was told to me in third grade, really it was a recap of second grade, that still rings in my mind more than 20 years later. I remember I flunked second grade. 
And I did so because Spanish was my first language. I barely knew how to spell or, or speak. And I remember when I flunked second grade the next year, I was hanging around the third graders who class I should have been with, and I was telling the kids, yeah, I flunked second grade because my parents were moving, so like the time we moved and everything, so I was making a lie. And this girl says, no, 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 you didn't flunk second grade because of that. You flunked second grade because you were so stupid you didn't know how to spell it. And that was true. <laughs> But more than 20 years later, that memory still rings in my mind. Here's another story. So three years ago, my son was born, almost th really three and a half. And the story you heard prior was a story of words that were said to me that stuck in my mind. But sometimes the word that, words that we say can get us in trouble. So here it is. Um, December 5th, 2019, our son is being born. My wife is in labor. I'm right next to her. If you've done this, she's right there. I'm like, baby, you got this. You can do it. The nurses are there. We're, everything's going great. And I decide this is a great time for me to preach. So I see the nurses and the doctors. I'm like, I wonder if they're saved. And I turned to her. I said, baby... If Jesus endured the cross, you can endure this. <laughs> Men, never say that ever to your wives, okay? And she looked at me and she went, not right now. And the nurse looked at me and was like, keep pushing, honey, keep pushing. So not all the times is it words that people say to us that affect us. Sometimes it's the words that come out of our mouth that affect our lives. So here's three points that I want to share with you tonight. Point number one is this, the power of the tongue. The power of the tongue. In medieval times, if you were seen as a threat or spoke against the kingdom, your tongue would be cut off fully removing the power of that person. Their thoughts were still intact and still in there, but their inability to speak them was now taken. Let's recap just a little bit. James 3, 5 through 6 again says, in the same way the tongue is a small thing that makes grand speeches, but a tiny spark can set a great forest on fire. You know that word that that young girl, that third grader said to me, it was so small, it was so meaningless, it was 20 years ago but some words that have been spoken to you in your life are still affecting you today. Right behind me, there's a Jenga set. This is you. This is your life here. This is everything you built today so far. There's pieces missing because the pieces missing are the things of your life and your purpose and your salvation and your joy that is also missing. Any word that's been spoken over you, like why did I create you? I don't even know why I married you. Why did I even have you? Why do I even come to church? Every single time we say a word like that, you're nicking off something that should be building. Now, I got myself in a lot of trouble using my words. Anybody? I always say this, that God blessed me with an ability to speak, but I always use it for the dark side. So one acronym that I heard recently, going to write this down, is the word WAIT. Stands for why am I talking? So when you're listening to someone, typically I'm the type of person that when they're saying something to me, I'm thinking of a great rebuttal and response that I can say to them, so I'm not even paying attention to what they're telling me. So one thing I need to tell myself is, all right, Brian, why am I talking? Is there a purpose to what I'm about to say, or do I just want to talk? Do I just want to have my way? Do I just want to hear the voice, my, the sound of my voice? It's funny because words are so powerful. We either get jobs or we lose jobs because of our words. We either get friends or lose friends because of our words. You either get in a relationship or get out of a relationship because of your words. You know, words have gotten you in position and words have gotten you out of position. These are words that we can say. I'm the mess up of my family. I'm the black sheep of my family. You know, six years ago or 10 years ago, I was in that place where I felt like the black sheep of my family. Have six and I'm the youngest, the oldest 
is a dean of a school. Next one was business owner. Next one was a police officer. Next one uh, uh, works at the railroad. Next one a teacher. And then there's Bryant. I wanted to be an actor. <laughs> Ten years ago, I end up getting cheated on by my second girlfriend. I ended up getting arrested that week as well. I ended up creating bitterness and anger inside of my heart. So I felt like the black sheep. And all those things I was reminding myself all of my life of why I couldn't be used by God. And there we go. There was another nick of my life. Falling and falling. And one thing we have to understand is although we're taking pieces out of our life, slowly but surely, it's still standing. You might still be standing. But your life isn't destroyed with one word. And your life isn't destroyed in one day. Your life is destroyed by an accumulation of words. Your life is destroyed by an accumulation of words that match with what Satan believes about you. I want to share a story in Matthew 4, 8 through 10. It says, next the devil took Jesus to the peak of a very high mountain and showed him all of the kingdoms of the world and their glory. Uh, Satan said, I will give it all to you. And he said, if you will kneel down and worship me. Jesus responds and says, get out of here, Satan. For the scriptures say you must worship the Lord your God and serve him only. I'd like to put a photo up behind of what a satanic witch set my wife two years ago. Do we have that photo in the back? So this was after our second baby. My wife was pregnant with our daughter and a satanic witch sent this message to my wife. This was about the time that I got placed as a youth pastor and it says, you have been warned. Your next child will be stillborn. Don't worry, I'll make room for them. So what could we have done? Baby, I don't know, what if she put a curse on us? What if this is real? What if our baby isn't going to be alive? What if we're not going to have a child? What if we're going to lose this child? But we took the scripts out of what Jesus said. And I said, baby, I don't care what this witch had to say to us. We're going to have a child who loves the Lord. Our baby will be born. We rebuke that in the name of Jesus. We do not receive it. I thank you, God, that whatever the devil said to me, I do not receive that. And there I go. I build back my life. This is what we have to understand. Every time a word has been spoken to us, it has taken some of our life. But every time we refuse to repeat the enemy's lies, we continue to build back our lives. So our daughter was born and our son was born. There was no stillborn child. How many lies have you meditated on? How many words have you repeated over yourself that are impacting your life today? I think some of our memories, whether good or bad, are typically connected to words. Some of your children are a direct result of the words that you've spoken over them. You know, a few months ago, I was t telling my three-year-old son, <laughs> I was telling my three-year-old son, I was saying, why did you say that? You need to learn how to control your mouth. And I felt like the Holy Spirit said, you expect a three-year-old to control his mouth, but a 33-year-old can't? I'm 33. It's funny because here are some words that we typically hear working at a church. This is a story that I heard of another pastor. A church member went up to a pastor to complain and said, Pastor, I've been praying for God to use me in this church and I'm not being used. So the pastor right away connects him to only six months later, that same man came complaining to the pastor that he feels all the church does is use him. <laughs> the same mouth that you use to sweet talk your wife is the same mouth you're using to break her down. The same mouth that got you that job in that interview is the same mouth that got you fired for cussing out your coworker. 
The same mouth that you talked a big old talk, I'm ready for ministry, I'm committed, I'm on fire, is the same mouth that comes with excuses when the rubber meets the road. The same mouth that prayed for God to use you in ministry is the same mouth you use to criticize everything and everyone in the church. Here's point number two, taming the tongue. Our words tell on us, don't they? Our words tell where our heart is. You know, we can't tame the tongue until we heal our heart. Luke 6, 45 says, A good person produces good things from the treasury of a good heart, and an evil person produces evil things from the treasury of an evil heart. What you say flows from what is in your heart. What's in your heart tonight? What's been in your heart the past 10 years? I can pretty much tell where someone's heart is by just speaking to them. Always critical, always complaining, always putting people down, always angry. You sound like you have unforgiveness in your heart. You sound like you have bitterness in your heart. You know, about 10 years ago was the same time where I kept coming up with these excuses. I hated my life. I would say, well, I'm not where I'm at because this happened. I'm not happy because my two girlfriends cheated on me. I'm not where I'm at because I felt like my dad wasn't there for me. I can't do this. I can't, I became a victim. And finally, I honestly had to look myself in the mirror and say, you know what, God? I'm no longer going to be a victim. I'm no longer going to keep blaming people for these mistakes. Yes, what people said to you was true. What people did to you was true. But you know what you are? You are a representation of what's in your heart. So your father left you 10 years ago, but your coworkers see that very effect every day. You got hurt by someone 20 years ago, but now your children are paying for it because everything they do, you criticize them. You are bitter, you are angry. You come into a church, you cannot receive from a pastor, you're not humble. You come into a church, you cannot submit, you're prideful. No man can teach me anything. You can't teach yourself either. And here's the thing. We have to understand that our hearts will affect our words. I want to just share a few things that I hate hearing whenever I talk to young adults or teens. I talk to a lot of young adults and they come up to me quite often and they say things like this, man, I just hate it because my parents forced me to go to church when I was younger. And you know what I do? I say, what? So your parents forced you to come into a church every single week, hear the word of God, be in a great environment, build a foundation of scripture in your life, and you hated them for doing so. I think you have ungratefulness in your heart. Because there's someone next to you while you're sitting there with your trauma of church. Oh, my parents forced me to take me to church every day, right? Did your parents force you to go to school either? But you're not mad at them for that. There's someone next to you with your ungrateful heart that said, I wish my parents forced me to go to church when I was younger. You know where my parents forced me to go? My parents forced me to go to the parties till 2 a.m. And that's where I got molested. My parents forced me to go to all the family members. My parents, while my mom was drinking, she let my cousin babysit me and he touched me. I wish my parents forced me to go to church because I probably wouldn't have gone through what I went through. Do you have ungratefulness in your heart? You can literally be aligning your language up with hell's plans for your life. Here's Matthew 26, 6 through 9. It says this. Meanwhile, Jesus was in Bethany at the home of Simon, a man who had previously had leprosy. While he was eating, a woman came in with a beautiful alabaster jar of expensive perfume and poured it over his head. The disciples were indignant when they saw this. What a waste, they said. It could have been sold for a high price and the money given to the poor. This was Judas as he was the treasurer. I want to ask you, do you have a Judas heart? Now everybody wants to have a David heart, right? Everybody wants to have a Paul heart. Everybody wants to have an Esther heart. But nobody wants to have a selfish heart or at least admit it. You know, a Judas heart criticizes someone or something, but in reality you wouldn't even do it yourself. 
What are they going to, oh, look at all the money they spent on these lights in this stage. Well, if I was a pastor, I would have probably spent that money for something else. Would you have? Would you have? I had this gentleman that came up to me a few months ago, and I was dealing with a situation with teenagers. They were talking, uh, you know, uh, causing a ruckus. And he pulls me to the side. He says, are you the pastor? I said, yes. He goes, then why aren't you doing your job? I said, what do you mean? There's these teens all fighting over here. If I was you, I would get these kids under control. I would take their phones away. I would force them to shut up. I would not allow them to speak, and I would make sure they sit in their chairs. I said, okay. I said, well, it seems like you really know a lot of what you're talking about. How about this? How about you join the youth ministry, all right, and you join me, and we do this together. And you know what he said? Nah, I don't have time for that, man. I'm not the kind of person to want to do that. A Judas heart. Someone who's always complaining. I get that all the time. You have a pride and critical heart. Every time you say, I don't need a pastor. No man can teach me anything. The church is full of hypocrites. Don't trust them with my money. All the leaders are the same. You're taking a page right out of the script of Satan. For instance, Judas was saying how the money should have been spent better. Yet he was taking the money for himself. No one wants to admit that you're acting like a Judas. Everyone wants to be a David. Well, this was David's language. He had a humble heart. Psalm 23, it says, Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid, for you are close and beside me. Your rod and your staff protect and comfort me. This is him again. It says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything in me that offends you and lead me along the path of everlasting life. Because he had a humble heart. You have a critical heart. You have a prideful heart. You don't say, test me, O God. You say, God, test them. Test them, O God. Point out anything in them that, point, that is wrong with them. How many times do we come into the church and say, oh, well, the parking lot, this, and the person sitting next to me. There's some people in my family or relatives where if I brought them to church, I would pray for the most perfect day. I'm not going to lie. I wouldn't have wanted me to preach tonight if I would have brought somebody. You know what I do? Uh, if, somebody, if I know somebody in my family who's very critical, if I bring them to church, I'm like, God, please let Pastor Marco be speaking tonight. And it, come on. Anybody admit that? Anybody admit Come on, I, you probably didn't expect to see me, okay? And I'm sorry, I'm sorry. God, I just, uh, please let Pastor Marco speak tonight. Lord, let no kids sit next to us. God, please keep the homeless man out of our row. Lord, you can put him in the row behind us, it's okay. Lord, shut off everybody's phone around us. That's how some of us are. Some of your family members are walking on eggshells because of you. There's mom again. And don't say anything. Mom's, she's mad. She's angry. She's going to pop off. And you think it's just your personality. Hood is not a personality. Bitterness is not a personality. Anger is not a personality. Pridefulness is not a personality. I think we, when I first came to the church, I said, God, I need you to change everything about me, everything of who I am. If it doesn't match with you, change it. My style, my personality, my jokes, all of it. If it does not match with you, get it out of my life. Six years ago, I came up to Pastor Gabriel and I said, Gabe, can I be in the 7 a.m. Sunday morning meetings with you and all the leaders? Every Sunday they have a 7 a.m. meeting. I just want to be a fly on the wall. Just listen. All the pastors. And you know what he said? No. Okay. All right. Why not? Why not? I can't trust you in that room, is what he told me. What do you mean? You can't trust me in that room. He said, every time there's a serious conversation happening, you always make a joke out of it. He said, remember last week when this person was in my office and he was telling me something about his family and you were just sitting there, you were like, so what about this, guys? He said, your inappropriate jokes are immature and I can't allow you to be in that room. And I realized, I looked at my life, I said, that, that's how I've done it all my life. That was my personality. 
that what I, that's what I was known for in high school. But my personality was keeping me away from my purpose. And I think you need to understand that you can't keep blaming things on your personality. If you're rude and inconsistent and bitter, you're destroying not only your life, but those around you. And if you think your words have no effect on people, you are lying to yourself. Here's the next one. Oh, before I go there, David was a man after God's own heart. And when David went after God's heart, he got God's words. When you go after the heart of sin, you'll get sinful words. How many people speak hell's language, get hell's results, and end up going to hell all because of the words that came out of their mouth? So how do we fix this? Well, point number three, we speak in heavenly languages. James 3, 9 through 12, it says, sometimes it praises our Lord and Father, and sometimes it curses those who have been made in the image of God. And so blessing and cursing come pouring out of the same mouth. Surely, my brothers and sisters, this is not right. Does a spring water bubble out of... Uh, with both fresh water and bitter water, does a fig tree produce olives or a grapevine produce figs? No, and you can't draw fresh water from a salty spring. We can't be speaking in tongues and gossiping in English. Here's the thing. Are you speaking God's words? Do you know what he would say in a situation? Preparing for a message... Tonight, do you think I got tempted to talk back? The past few weeks, there's been things said to me, and I'm like, Lord, I could say something right now that would belittle them. Oh, that's a good joke. Mm, my God, that would tear them down. Oh, that's a good one right there. If I, just, if I were just able to tell them that, that is hilarious. The look on her face would be incredible. But I've had to shut my mouth. I've had to control myself. Bitterness, bitter hearts produce bitter words. And again, that's why you're always angry. That's why your words are always angry. Jeremiah 24, seven says this, I will change their hearts then they will know that I am the Lord. They will be my people and I will be their God. They will return to me with all of their heart. Only God can change our heart that changes our words that ultimately changes our lives. So what are we talking about here tonight? Tonight is a night where you come in exactly where you're at with whatever is missing in your life and you stop repeating the devil's lies through your mouth. I'm no good. God's never going to use me. I, 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 I'm the black sheep of the family. I've done too much with my body. Complaining, criticism, anger, all of these things I can tell are in your heart. And I'm not going to teach you how to master your words if you don't master your heart. So tonight is a night to get a heart change. Tonight is a night where you're going to give your heart to Jesus. Tonight is a night where you're going to say yes to God finally. Tonight is a night where you're going to turn your entire life around. You are literally the person who everybody thinks is always angry. You walk around with an angry face all the time. With a bitter face all the time. Do you think people have hurt me? Of course. Do you think people have offended me? Of course. Try serving in ministry. <laughs> but here's the reality. If Jesus had a Judas, what are we going to deal with? We're going to deal with people who leave us. We're going to deal with people who hurt us. We're going to deal with people who say things about us. We're going to deal with people who offend us. We're going to deal with people who say horrible things about us. We're going to deal with witches who try to come up in my wife's DM and try to curse my children. But here's the reality. I gave my heart to Jesus. He changed my heart. I forgave people. I submitted to God. He healed my heart. And therefore, my words started changing. But here's the thing with you, if you don't change your heart, your bitterness of that man walking out of your life 20 years ago, 
I hate him so much. Why did I even spend any time with him? Hasn't knocked over yet, but you're tearing your life apart. Oh, no. I'll never submit to anybody in church. The last church that I was at, that pastor did something horrible. Ain't no man can teach me again. There you go. Why would anybody love me? I got three kids and my husband left me. There you go. I've been arrested. I've been to prison. I've lost so many jobs. I've let down my family all my life. No one trusts me. Ten years ago, you couldn't trust me with anything. Nobody looked up to me ten years ago. Nobody came up to me for wisdom. Nobody came up to me for advice. I was just a poor boy who got beat down by other people's words and my own. I became an atheist. God isn't real. God is fake. If God was so good, why would this happen to me? Everybody in the church are hypocrites. I'm never going to get married. And there we go. My life started falling apart, little by little. But you're still standing, but barely. Now you're 30, 40, 50 years old, and you wonder why you have no relationships or friendships. You wonder why your children don't want to speak to you. You wonder why you get fired from every job. It's not always the boss. You're on your fourth discipleship group. That wasn't meant to be funny, but I guess it was. <laughs> this is the 10th church you've been part of in the past 10 years because every leader is imperfect. There you go. There you go. All those lies. Every single person you criticize. I'll never go to church. I'll never give my life to God. This is just a little bit of weed. I just drink on the weekends. Those words. Those alcohol-filled words have destroyed your family. You stick up more for the alcohol than you do for your family. You can't let go of things because they're so, they're so prideful. Why are you so prideful? I know I'm 33, but don't take it as me speaking to you. Take it as a word of God speaking to you. There you go again. Speaking death and lies. Until finally your whole life falls apart. Your wife leaves you. You get taken out of ministry. Your children don't want to talk to you. You have suicidal thoughts. You sleep with a different man every other week. You haven't spoken to your children in 10 years. When are you going to change your words? But really, when are you going to heal your heart? Tonight is a night to heal the heart. Tonight is a night to heal the thing that drives your words, which drives your life. Tonight is a night to stop saying the excuses. Tonight is a night to say yes to Jesus. Tonight is a night to finally take your life back. Tonight is a night to say, I don't, I don't have much, but God... You called me. You've chosen me. I'm a child of God. I'm forgiven. I'm loved. Whatever I made mistakes, you're going to restore them. You're going to reconcile. I'm going to get a good job. I'm going to serve in ministry. I'm going to love my children. I'm going to be sober. I'm going to preach one day. I'm going to have a family. I'm going to have a job. I'm going to love my children. And you keep building and building and building and building because of the words that you're speaking. Ultimately, the words came from a healed heart.
So tonight, let's stand up. So many of you need to give your hearts to Jesus tonight. If you have not given your heart to Jesus, don't allow your lips to lead you out this door without doing it. Tonight, let's reconcile. Some of you, I don't know, I think someone needs to call up their, their child tonight and say, baby, I'm so sorry for the words that I spoke to you all of your life. I was so hard on you, but it's just because I just didn't want you to do the things that I did, but I took it out on you. I think some of you are going to get reconciled tonight to family members. But first, heal your heart. It's the last scripture. Romans 10, 8 through 10 says this. The message is very close at hand. It's at your fingertips. What you've been waiting for. The change you've been wanting is at your fingertips. It's on your lips. It's in your heart. And that message is the very message about faith that we preach. If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God, and it is by openly declaring your faith that you are saved. So tonight, close your eyes all around this sanctuary. As Christian had us look at what we're grateful in our lives, I want you to look at the things you've destroyed in your lives. Are you ready to, for God to turn that around? Are you ready to be forgiven? Are you ready to change your life? Are you ready to get your heart healed? Are you ready to change your words so that you can change your life? If you're ready, I believe you need to give your life to Jesus tonight. So I'm going to make two calls. The first call is this. If this message impacted you and you need prayer and you need to forgive and you need someone to come into agreement, I'm going to ask you to come up to this altar and stand in front and we're going to have some people pray for you. So tonight, if this message impacted you, come up to the front. If I was speaking to you tonight, come up to the front. Receive healing, receive forgiveness, receive prayer. Don't talk yourself out of this. Don't remove yourself from the situation. Don't worry about what the other person is saying next to you. I need my heart healed tonight. I'm going to go get prayer. I'm going to go to the altar. I'm going to leave it at the altar. Come on. Come up to the front. Let's receive our freedom tonight. Let's receive our freedom tonight. I'm proud of you. I'm proud of you. Let go of that stony, bitter heart. Remove the scales off of your heart. Tear down the walls surrounding your heart. You can't move forward because your heart is surrounded by walls and stone. And no one can penetrate, not even God. Tonight. You need to remove those walls so that God can finally move in your life. Awesome. I'm proud of you. Keep coming up. Keep coming up. Tonight is a night of healing. Let's get our hearts healed. Let's get our hearts healed. Come on. Let's cheer mom, family. Let's get our hearts healed tonight. And this last message is you giving your life to Jesus. Because here's the reality. I used to be in sales, and when I sold something, I would try to say, hey, this is why this is better than X, Y, and Z. But I'm not trying to sell you anything, because if I were, it would mean that there was another option, and there isn't. There's no other option but Jesus. There's no other option but saying yes to him. Not all roads lead to heaven, that's a lie. It's just Jesus. It's not you. You cannot do it on your own. Stop believing that lie. 
you've led yourself this far and you've you're destroyed yourself this far. It's time to say yes to Jesus. So if tonight's your night, you feel a tingling, that's the Holy Spirit, that's not goosebumps. I'm going to challenge you on the count of three to publicly raise your hand and that means you're going to give your life to Jesus. You're going to let everybody know it. You've let everybody know your drama. You've let everybody know the cuss words. You've let everybody know your pain. You've let everybody know your destruction. It's time for you to let everybody know who you're now serving. On the count of three, raise your hands all around this room if you're going to give your life to Jesus tonight. One, two, three. Raise your hands all across this room. Awesome. Awesome. I'm proud of you. I'm proud of you. I'm proud of you. Right over there. I'm proud of you. If you did raise your hand, I'd like you to come up to the altar. If somebody raised their hand right next to you, please say, hey, let's go down to the altar. I'll take you with me. Come down to the altar. If you need prayer, come down to this altar. We have more altar workers. We need healing tonight. We need prayer tonight. We need reconciliation tonight. Awesome. They're coming. Awesome. Thank you, Lord. Let's heal our marriages by healing our hearts. Let's heal our families by healing our hearts. Let's heal our ministries by healing our hearts. Amen, amen, amen. Awesome. So if you're down here, I want to say I'm so proud of you. I was in the same place 10 years ago. This is the best place to be. There's no shame in being where you're at. If anything, you're shaming the devil. Look what you tried to take me, but now I'm building my life tonight. You're going to start building your life back because you're going to heal your heart. I know he touched you. I know he abused you. I know she left you. I know they hurt you. But it's time to heal your heart so that you can heal your words. It is time for your ministry to get back in position. So tonight, if you needed your heart healed, I want you to put your hand over your heart. Repeat after me. Say, Jesus, heal my heart. Remove all bitterness, anger, unforgiveness, frustration from my heart. I forgive. And I want you to say the person who you need to forgive. I want you to say their name. Say, I forgive Bobby. I forgive Richard. I forgive Bryant. And then say what you forgive them for. What did they do to you? For touching me, for leaving me, for hurting me, for abandoning me, for rejecting me, for not supporting me for not being there for me when I needed them. Say, I forgive them and I let it go completely. And remember, when you forgive them, it doesn't mean that what they did to you is okay. It means you're finally letting go of the pain that's stopping you. So here we go. If you've decided to give your life to Jesus, I want you to repeat after me. This prayer does not save you. It's your heart connected to the words that save you if you just say these words but your heart doesn't mean it doesn't mean anything so you're ready say Jesus tonight I heard the gospel tonight I believed it tonight I declare that Jesus died on the cross conquered death resurrected and gave me life I publicly declare that I repent of my sin, my way, and I turn from them to follow you, Jesus. Today, I'm a Christian. I'm saved. I'm set free. I'm a disciple. I'm healed. And I'm ready to start building back my life in the mighty name of Jesus. I pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.